What's up YouTube and welcome back to the channel. For those of you guys that are new here, my name is Luigi Gonzalez and I'm an upcoming second year medical student at the University of California Irvine School of Medicine in California. Today we're going to be talking about probably my most favorite thing to look at in the internet back when I was applying to medical school and that's the what are my chances thread in Reddit. For those of you guys that might not be familiar with what I'm talking about, the what are my chances thread in Reddit is a place where people medical school applicants can post their stats, their extracurricular activities, their weaknesses, their strengths, their list of schools that they're interested in applying to, and other people in the same group can comment as to what they think the person, the original poster's chances of getting into the schools are. So with that said, it could be somewhat helpful because some of the people are doctors, medical students, members of the admissions committee for medical schools, so those insights are definitely going to be valuable but most of the times even other times you know like some of those people are just going to be people in the same application cycle people who just recently got accepted and some are just flat out trolls but during my time applying i was honestly spending so much time looking at that thread to kind of relate myself to other applicants and see what people say about their application because mine is similar but at the end i just ended up trying to stay away from it because it was doing more harm than good in terms of my mental state. But with that said, let's go ahead and look at some of these applications and talk about what we think. The first post that we're gonna look at is posted by God's Bread. And as you can see right here, there's a tag where he's a re-applicant. So that's important to take note of because I feel like typically re-applicants are on the harder side in terms of getting in because medical schools expect a lot from them when they reapply in terms of what they've done to improve since the last application cycle. But with regards to that, let's take a look at some of the important things to take note here. As you guys can see, in terms of like ethnicity, white female, location, Virginia public school grad. With regards to that, I feel like I can't really give my opinion about that. It's just hard for me to tell how much of an impact socioeconomic status, ethnicity, all of those things like are so i don't really have a lot to say about that but in terms of more like objective numbers with the gpa the cumulative gpa science gpa and mcat score that's definitely very very important to take note of so as you guys can see cumulative is 3.78 science gpa is 3.68 and the mcat is 521 which honestly is pretty amazing that's high 90 percentile mcat score so overall, it's pretty great. And it's even important to take note of these little things like the upward trend that he mentioned. Let's see. So he said that it wasn't really a good upward trend. The spring semester of the junior year was the worst. Um, okay, so there's like a little bit of a dip, but then it went back up to 4.0. So honestly, I don't feel like that's that big of a deal. Clinical experience, wow, 21,000 hours as a medical assistant. So. 21,000 hours is a lot and then he said that he's gonna gain another 2,000 hours this year and I feel like that's because during your gap year which is the time that you take after you graduated that might be where he or she got this from um, in regards to volunteering 200 hours that's pretty good also let's see she was able to be program director her senior year so that's a leadership experience to take note of and then she's gonna work at a free clinic for seven hours this month. Wow, she's doing a lot. Shadowing 16 hours, pediatric neurology. Usually I feel like, I think this might just be me, but with regards to shadowing, I'd like to see more of a diverse shadowing just to see that, you know, you've actually took a dive into the whole field of medicine and not just a small like snippet of it. Like pediatric neurology is a very, very specific specialty. And I'm not sure how much of the other parts of medicine you'll see by going through that. But if that's what she's interested in, then 16 hours of shadowing is really, really good. Um, research, four years, 3,000 hours. Damn, that's that's a lot. So in the same lab and it's basic science, even though there was no publications, she was able to do two poster presentations and two oral presentations. So those are pretty good, especially because she won third place. She had some, um, you know, like research grants, very important to take note of scholars finalist and she wrote a thesis extracurricular activities so theater i don't know how i missed that theater um, and other artistic endeavors so 
this might just be me and my bias, but during my application cycle, I put in, um, you know, like doing YouTube. And back then I was talking about sneakers and selling sneakers. And for all of my interviews, that's literally what the majority of it involved. They didn't ask too much about my research, about classes, volunteering. I mean, they asked a little bit, but a lot of what the actual talk or the interview was about was my artistic endeavors because that's what made me human. So I feel like it's definitely important to note what other extracurriculars you did, especially if it's not relating to medicine because that'll differentiate you from the rest of the pack. And then letter of recommendations. So she has one from her research PI, anthropology professor, that's very different. Um, and then neuro professor, which she says is her weakest. So that's kind of a concern because you'd want your strongest letter of recommendation from a science professor because what medical schools look at is that you're able to handle the rigors of the scientific classes that they're going to put you through because it's going to be a lot and her volunteer director all right so overall so far like just from looking at her complete application this is a very strong applicant i'm honestly surprised that she didn't get in the first time so i'm trying to think why but you know, she said she was a reapplicant. This might be before she was able to boost her GPA. And maybe she had an MCAT score before that wasn't as good. But it's hard to imagine that she's a reapplicant. So now let's look at the list. So she said that it's top heavy, which means that it's a lot of those schools that are very high up there on the list, like high ranking schools. So let's see what she has Virginia Tech, Tulane. EVMS, I'm not sure what that is. Wake Forest, George Washington, Tufts, Miami, North Carolina, Dartmouth, Rochester, VCU, USC, Emory, Georgetown, Case Western, Duke, Stanford, Vanderbilt, UVA, Mayo Clinic, Northwestern, uh, Brown, Hopkins, and NYU. So I feel like there are a lot, a majority of these schools are very, very high up there in terms of ranking yeah like this is gonna be a tough one i would probably recommend this applicant to add more of like the not really like lower tier but schools that don't require as high of like a gpa or an mcat score i know that she's really up there in terms of both gpa and mcat but some of these schools in terms of average gpas for getting in is like a 3.9 or like a mid 3.9 whereas her cumulative gpa is a 3.8 her extracurricular activities are strong but the main focus would be GPA and MCAT and I feel like for her MCAT score she should be fine most of these schools are like 520 MCAT score is like their average acceptance or even lower but with the GPA that would be where the issue comes in but I feel like she has a good chance at these I'm kind of curious as to see where she'll end up so with that said let's move on to the next applicant for the next applicant and with regards to their background they mentioned being black immigrant FGLI I'm not exactly sure what that means but I'll definitely look it up 3.9 GPA, 519 MCAT, both really, really good. Gates Scholar, I'm not sure what that one is either. And a T10UG. Oh, I think that means top 10 undergrad school. Another important thing to look at just because medical schools look at how rigorous your undergrad is. A 4.0 at a lower level undergrad might not look as good as a 3.8 at a top 10 undergrad. So those are important factors to take into account. Um, California slash Virginia resident, but they're trying to move closer to home, Virginia. So with regards to their extracurricular activities, 1500 hours of research, that's a good amount. Independent research project that got $9,000 of grant with one poster presentation. That's pretty nice. 100 hours of basically working a job, 20 hours of clinic volunteering. Okay. I was kind of worried once I saw 20 hours, I was like, wait, only 20 hours of like clinical volunteering, but they said that they're going to get 300 more this summer, hundred hours of shadowing, which is really good, especially since it's diverse with four specialties, 200 hours of non-clinical volunteering with food banks. So overall, like there's, there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Um, executive roles in two store organizations. So that's the leadership portion of it. And they're starting a subreddit for pre-meds at the school. That's basically like what we're looking at here, which is like a subreddit for pre-meds. Um, with regards to the letter of recommendations, she has five, to, he or she, I'm not sure who it is, um, five to eight to choose from. And they said that it's very, very strong. So I'll take their word for it. 
hobbies, poetry, sports, music, music, and cooking. So with regards to that, I feel like poetry is the one that's gonna make them stand out if they talk about it a lot more. A lot of applicants would mention like doing sports, um, playing musical instruments because that's something that a lot of people do. But poetry, that's pretty rare. That that can separate you from the rest of the group. And then it'll be okay. So then they even also mentioned their idea of what their letter, not letter, but personal statement would look like. They're gonna focus it on being a psychiatrist and returning to her native, his or her native country to develop mental health care infrastructure. That's like, what I like about that personal statement is that it's very deep, very meaningful, but also it's very specific. So they really have like a specific plan in mind, which I think is really important to have to make a good um, personal statement. So then let's now let's take a look at their school list. Columbia, Cornell, Harvard. Wow. Yeah, so, okay, Harvard, New York, Mount Sinai, San Francisco, Stanford, Duke, Yale, John Hopkins, Pennsylvania, Vanderbilt, Chicago, Boston, Brown, UCLA, Virginia, Emory, Michigan, Northwestern. Wow. This is a, this is a very, very risky application just because in terms of, like, the number of schools, that's not a lot of schools, like, around 20, 25-ish schools. And it's all like the top schools. I know that this person has 3.9, 519. Stats are good, extracurriculars are good, but it's still pretty risky for me. I feel like there should always be some schools that your application is going to be above on just in case something like doesn't work out here. Like for example, some of these schools, I mean, obviously not all of these schools are gonna invite you for an interview. But with some of the schools that do end up inviting you for an interview, what if you don't click well with the interviewer? You also have to take that into account. There's a lot of these like untangibles that, you know, like you never know could pop up. So that's why it's always good to have these backup schools where you might seem better. It might be like a school where your stats are way better than the averages, just so that you have a safety school. So that's something that you can fall back on in case something does go wrong, which I hope not for this person. But yeah, like this is going to be very risky. But overall, I feel like if they expand their school list more, they definitely have a good shot of getting in this upcoming cycle. I know the first two apps were kind of like crazy high in terms of stats, scoring, and extracurricular activities. So I tried to find one that's, you know, not as high just to have like a realistic look of what other applications are like. I know if you're posting on Reddit, you must have like either be really looking for honest opinions and you're okay with showing your stats not being as good, but more likely than not, a lot of those people are like, Oh, I have really good stats. I just want to know and get that encouragement from other people that, yeah, like you have a good chance of getting in. So I know like if you have a lower stats and you know, you might not be as confident with your application, you're more hesitant to put it out there in public, even though you could have like a Reddit name that's not really associated with you. It's still hard for you to put it out there. So I think these are, this is one of the examples that I found that aren't as high, but it's, I would say like a decent um, application. So if we take a look here, cumulative GPA, so male, and they mentioned ORM, which means overrepresented. Um, so then let's see here. CG, uh, cumulative GPA, 3.54. Science GPA, 3.48. Decent upward trend, that's good to note. So you can see they went from 3.4, 3.3, all the way up to 3.76, and 3.76 again the following uh, year. So that's a good upward trend that you'd like to see. And MCAT is 511. Not too good, but at the same time, it's not bad. 511 was the average um, MCAT scores for applicants, I think, this past cycle. So 127 all over um, and a 130 in the biology section. So it's pretty good. Now let's take a look at the extracurricular activities with regards to I think so being a youth leader at a church would be non-clinical volunteering but 4,000 hours is a lot so I definitely feel like that will be a big part of this person's extracurricular activities like section what they write about um, so it's mostly like teaching kids one year of leadership managing over 25 kids okay so that shows like a lot of leadership and ability to work with people from different backgrounds different ages um, 200 hours and 
a club called Tent City Collective. So I'm not sure what that is, but the fact that they noted it must mean that it's something like meaningful to them. And it might not be medical related. So let's see here. Hosting a Tent City on our university campus, combat the demonetization of our unhoused neighbors. Okay, so I think this is like a club that's tackling the issue of, you know, homelessness. So I think that I, I would still say that that's considered non-clinical volunteering based on what they did. Um, and of course, COVID had to ruin everything um, with regards to other stuff. So, OK, so they specify clinical volunteering, 100 hours and a medical mission. Yeah, they mentioned it's kind of controversial and there's a lot of those things going on. Um, what else did they do? Medical externship at an internal medicine clinic. So one thing about that, I feel like that's similar to like shadowing an internal medicine doctor, which is good. Um, 70 hours as a patient escort at the university hospital. So I feel like that's more of those generic volunteering that you do at hospitals where you're helping um, transport patients and just providing comfort to patients, which is also pretty important. And they have paid clinical hours as a medical assistant that's 1,200 hours is a lot. So yeah, that's pretty good in terms of their clinicals. Research, none. So, oh my God. So that's like the biggest like no-no for me. Research is very, very important now in medical school and getting into medical school before they see it as something that you can add to your app to make it more competitive. But now it's like a box where if it's checked, even if you did way more hours than somebody else, that's the same. But if you don't have it, then that's a big red flag. Strong personal statement, a uh, personal letter from the president of the youth group, yeah, doctor that he works with, and clinic manager, that's a might. So I think they'll need a, a couple more um, letter recommendations. And with regards to, okay, so they have generic and okay letters. I mean, you'd ideally want everything to be strong. Um, and then now let's take a look at their list of schools that they want to apply to. So UW is a pretty good school and hard to get into unless you're like a resident there. Um, Washington State University, University of Cal okay, Arizona, California. So they definitely want to stay West Coast, like what they said. But with regards to their stats, a lot of these schools are, a lot of the West Coast and East Coast schools usually have higher um, GPA and MCAT requirements. So it'll definitely be tough. Um, but at least they added like some osteopathic schools, which typically have lower GPA and um, MCAT requirements, but they do have certain um, like prerequisites that you need. I think, for example, a certain amount of time shadowing a DO specifically. Um, I'll have to look into that because I wasn't too familiar with the DO application um, since I only applied to MD schools. But a lot of these schools, I feel like are within the range, especially the DO schools. Um, more of the MD schools, honestly, I feel like aren't really within range, but honestly, like with regards to getting invited for interviews, I feel like medical schools definitely like to take chances on people. I know what people say is like a lot of medical schools have cutoffs where if your GPA is lower than this, they don't even look at your application, they just toss it. So we'll have to ask somebody from the admissions committee about that. But overall, if they do want to go to an MD, then definitely like look for more schools that are on the lower like GPA and lower MCAT score, especially since they only have a 5.11 and a 3.6. Okay, so we finished taking a look at two very, very good over the top applications and one I would say more average kind of application in terms of GPA and MCAT scores. So honestly, I just can't wait to see where those people end up. I hope they'll post and let us know just because it's nice seeing what their application is like, what their worries were, what their goals were in terms of what school they'll end up in and to see them actually get into one of those schools, it'll be very inspiring. So definitely hope that they get into some good schools. If you guys are going through this application cycle and want me to do a review similar to this of your application, feel free to email me. My email is going to be in the link down below. So you can just reach out, send me whatever information you wanted to send in terms of your application and I'll make sure to do a review of it later on in the future. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you really enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button. Make sure to share this video with your friends that are going through the application cycle so that they can have a better idea of what it takes to get in. And with that said, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace.